We've got some fresh new young talent doing some things that I know you haven't heard before. One, two, three, listen. Welcome to Finances, your home for all things financial, investment, money, and lifestyle. Hosted and curated by the very talented team of certified financial planners and Burke Britain Financial Partners. This is episode number 106 of the Finances Podcast. Uh, Today's guest is uh, Andrew Patterson, partner and senior mortgage broker at Aussie Wide Financial Services. Uh, Andrew, uh, thanks for for joining us on uh, the Finances Podcast this morning, mate. Thank you very much for having me and for the opportunity to be here. No no worries. Now, I'm not going to tell the story that I just said, but I did did catch up with... uh, uh, your business partner Scott McDonald yesterday at a breakfast. We've got um, Michelle Gertz coming in later. Um, did Scott tell you much about that breakfast, mate, or not? No, he didn't actually. He mentioned he saw you there, but yeah. uh, didn't give me too much detail. Uh, he, or, he, he spent so much time networking. I'll tell you what, oh, I, was I, a I said to Amy, machine. I said, Did you see Scott? And she said, Oh, yeah. I said, He would have known half the people in that room. He just yeah. knows ev- everywhere he goes. Yeah. I think you were saying just before we hit record that uh, Scotty likes that environment. Yeah, he's good. Good with an audience. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, and he's uh, yeah, he's certainly uh, well respected, well known. As is um, Aussie Wide. Now, I, I wrote a little bio, I shortened a bio for you guys. Can I have a go at like uh, go for it. The, the bio of Aussie Wide? So, uh, a trusted name in Geelong and Ballerine Peninsula region for over twenty two years. Mm-hmm. Uh, Aussie Wide's been helping homeowners secure the best loans while saving thousands on interest fees and tax. A dedicated team rooted in the community prides itself on personalised service and expert guidance throughout the home loan process. How's that, mate? Sounds pretty good I'll to be, me. I'll be your copywriter from now on, if that's uh, okay. Absolutely. I'll give you the marketing <laughs> guy's details and you can redo the website. Uh, now, we always like to, for the first episode, any guests, we like to go back a little bit. So this podcast and standalone when you come back on for a second and third, <laughs> third round. Uh, before we get into... Aussie wide and exactly what you do and some hard hitting questions from Ben around uh, interest rates. What's happening? Interest rates. Market, we'll definitely talk everything. about that. Yep. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> uh, tell us a bit about yourself. Where'd you grow up? Uh, where'd you go to school? Uh, and eventually, how did you get into sort of uh, property finance? Tell us a bit about where it all began. Yeah, beautiful. Thanks, Jay. Uh, look, grew up in Melbourne, uh, in the uh, in the eastern suburbs of Melbourne. Um, sort of born and bred, Uh, parents had lived there since the 70s, Uh, went to school and high school in uh, in Camberwell, Um, in the after school went to university at Deakin Uni in Burwood, so very much entrenched in that inner east area. Um, At university uh, sort of fell into studying commerce which had a bit of a financial planning, finance and a bit of commercial law uh, major to it as well. And then out of uni, uh, found my way into financial planning, of all things, actually. Um, the, the story there was I came home from uh, uni at lunch one day and mum and dad had their financial advisor over uh, doing a review at the kitchen table and we got talking and I was finishing off my degree and he offered me to come in for a bit of a trial. Um, as we were just saying before, it was probably the worst time to enter financial planning, uh, 2007, 2008, as the GFC was sort of really ramping up, I suppose. So uh, did planning for a little while, um, mainly just in a para planning role, um, but always had that love for sort of finance and real estate. Uh, ever since I was a young kid, I'd, you know, most weekends there was an open house, an auction going on in the area. Um, I would sort of go along and, and check out what was happening. So you weren't doing kick, you were doing open homes, <laughs> is that right? Yeah. <laughs> he had his little mini suit yeah. on, just yeah. walking the streets. <laughs> That's what I was picturing. Yeah, yeah exactly. I was the penciler, you know. <laughs> okay. No, 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 not at all. But um, what, what, did, what did your folks do? Like, Yeah, so, uh, look, uh, Dad worked in television yeah. uh, for his entire life. Uh, in, in, um, started in Australia, then in London, uh, Toronto for a little while, uh, and then back working for the major networks in, um, in Australia. Well, your dad's in media and this is your first podcast. What's, What's going, going on? Say, no wonder he's a natural. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> it's in your blood. Yeah, media training. No, 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 <laughs> not at all. Um, so your dad, television producer and, and director for news. Um, and mum has worked for the Victoria Police for about 40 odd years. Yeah, what does uh, she do there? She's actually a librarian and researcher um, with the police force, so helps all the young cadets uh, coming through with Imagine their studies. if she was your librarian at school. <laughs> You'd be thinking you're going to get in trouble, get arrested. I uh, <laughs> oh, look at school and uni. I definitely had the best referenced uh, assignments, you know, with the little table you have to do. But um, yeah, mum still to this day works four days a week, uh, four days a week for the police, um, and yeah, dad's retired now. 
So mum's a bookworm, dad's into media and you like property. Where did where did property and finance come out of all of that? I don't know, maybe just uh just just a, always as I said, love for real estate. Like I've just um numbers have always sort of been my thing. Um not overly gifted at sports or anything like that like happily give it a go but um but yeah just sort of always love numbers because you could sort of can't really hide behind them um and and real estate as well you know tying i suppose finance and the love of property together is sort of where i've landed now um then uh yes out of financial planning um that sort of uh, fell apart a little bit uh and sharing an office space was a real estate company uh, so I sort of found my way into that part time, and, and then the, that ended up being full time. A uh, bit of traditional real estate in the Glen Iris area, um, but then also a lot of project marketing. Excuse me. So selling, you know, brand new properties around the, around Australia, uh, and obviously finance was a huge part of that. So I, I sort of started to enjoy the finance side more and more and more, uh, and that's actually where I first met Scott. Um, he was my BDM at the aggregator that I joined. Uh, back then, he didn't really even know my name because uh, I was very much one of the one of the smaller operators. But we got to know each other really well through that role. Um, and then, yeah, when I was, we had a, a one year old uh, when I was thirty one. Uh, moved down here for lifestyle reasons. Uh, wanted to live by the beach and just get out of the hustle and the bustle of the city. Uh, move, uh, commuted for about a year back up to Melbourne, which took its toll, uh, then found out little uh, little son number two was coming along and uh, decided, no, nah, now I want to be a bit closer to home. And uh, and I actually approached Scott about setting up my own business. I was going to give it a go being a sole operator. Uh, and he sort of just, he let me go through all the all the paperwork, all the agreements, everything I needed to do, register the, 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 uh, the, the trust and the company. And then the last minute said, hey, I've got an opportunity for you. Uh, and that's uh, that's Aussie wide. Um, so that was in 2018. Um, we took over. So awesome. yeah, so I was going to say Aussie wide's been around for 22 years. So Aussie wide had been in existence. What happened there? How, how did you uh, both come to take on that existing business? Yeah. So um, the original owner uh, Gary and Diane Smith, uh, they had started the business uh, yeah about 25 years ago, I believe. Um, they just got to the point of wanting to retire. They went out looking for someone to take over that they could trust to look after the, the business that they had, they had built and, and wanted their clients to be looked after. And uh, they, they were under the same aggregator um, AFG that, that we were. Um, so once it sort of got known that they were looking to sell, um, you know, both Scott and myself being local now, um, we just got introduced and, and started the conversation. And, and yeah, here we are six years later. Haven't looked back. How did you how did you get going back a little bit with the property stuff? Did you did you enjoy that sales sort of side of it, or is that what you liked at the start but found maybe not like a long term love yeah. for? Look, I did. I, I loved it at the start, and I loved seeing um, all aspects of real estate. So it was new build apartments, townhouses, house and land packages, but not so much on the existing real estate side. So it was very much geared at investors, uh, and I probably found that over time, you know, it was a bit of a tough market back then and sort of trying to, to get people into certain types of investment and being really honest, I started to not necessarily believe in it. Like I liked the lure of existing real estate, um, things that you could get in and, and renovate and add value that way. Um, so I sort of probably started to gravitate a little bit more towards the finance side. So um, is, that, is, that, that. is that an aversion to the sort of the sales pitch aspect of it, the investment properties and development or did you find that you were having difficulty getting people financed. I thought you wanted to jump on the other side of the other side of the fence. Look, it was it, probably a little bit of both. It was uh, a bit of an aversion to that type of property in in the end. Um, wasn't necessarily seeing the results come mm. through for the for the customers. Um, but I think it just came back to that core at university, you know, and, and through through school, um, I just sort of really enjoyed the finance side of it and the numbers. And more, I saw finance as the opportunity to really get in and help people achieve what they want to achieve. Um, so much of everything that we do revolves around debt. Um, so you can obviously have that negative view of debt or that positive view that it's the avenue to allow you to, you know, do what you want to do in life. Um, so probably I saw, you know, my nature is to want to try and, and help and uh, help people and achieve what they want to achieve. And I saw finance as 
probably the more suitable path to that. It's very interesting, even maybe with the, because they were so investment based, what you were selling is that you sort of lose a little bit of that personal touch of people, it becomes very transactional. Mm. Like when you're helping with finance at the moment, no doubt lots of investment, but also people buying a home to live in or you know upgrading their family home. And that's where, and again, from our perspective, and I'm sure the same, you get a lot of enjoyment out of that, but when you're dealing with sort of pure investment, it's a bit, bit more cold, a bit more brutal, probably not as much. Yeah. love out of it <clears throat> absolutely is not nowhere near as much emotion uh and and that's a huge part of our role as I'm, as it is with yours as well you know that emotion of a first home buyer getting in and you know it's picked up the keys of their you know thought you know achieved something they didn't necessarily think was possible and knowing that you've been part of that um whereas as you said ben that sort of investor side it was just it was just numbers uh and when you didn't necessarily see the numbers working out um yeah probably pushed me away from feeling as comfortable being involved in that world and um, and wanting to be more on, on the finance side. It, it's interesting when you talk about the level of interest you have in client scenarios. I think the, the maybe the perception, maybe broking like financial planning has a bit of a, a, bit of a warped perception about what we do and who we are. Hmm. And I think for the, the majority of people, the idea of a mortgage broker is probably a very transactional experience. And I think one of the things that we've recognized in dealing with mortgage brokers and I suppose anyone, whether it be solicitors or other professionals, is that those that really excel are those that have genuine interest in the client outcome, Mm -hmm. but also have a a sort of a problem solving brain. The ones that have got a genuine interest in finding the right outcome for the clients. I know you guys had some, or you specifically had some awards of recent time um, am I right in saying regional broker of the year finalist 22, 24 and winner in 23? Yep. Yeah. Yep. So w- what, what's the basis for that award? How do they, how do they work out that you're a, um, you know, the best broker going around? Is it purely a numbers game or is there a sort of a, 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 um, a relationship element to that? Yeah, definitely. Look, very honored to, um, to be a finalist and then, and then win that award that year. Um, it, look, it's not just numbers. Numbers obviously play a, a part in it. Uh, your progression through the industry, year-on-year year growth, that sort of thing. But the customer experience and, and satisfaction also plays a, a massive part in it. Um, that sort of ties into the award that we picked up at this year's uh, event, which was the Customer Service Award uh, from an office. Um, so I think the uh, you know the the numbers yeah they are important of course and that that is the metric our industry uses to sort of differentiate what's the easiest metric i should say to differentiate how one broker performs against another um but i think the the more important metric is that customer experience because ultimately if you're not giving a good experience to your customer the numbers are irrelevant i was going to say the numbers come off the back of being you know giving a good experience yeah exactly in short term maybe you get a bit of a sugar hit but if you're not doing the right thing by people they'll quickly go elsewhere. Exactly. So on the customer service side of things, what is your differentiation? What's the point of differentiation for you guys as opposed to every other broker uh, on every other corner in, in Geelong? Look, I think we're very lucky in Geelong. Uh, the broking industry is very strong down here and uh, and everyone does a fantastic job for their clients. Um, look, I think really our, our, our differentiation, if we have to find one, is that well, kind of like every broker, we just genuinely care about the outcome for the client. We all come to work every day loving what we do. Um, and as you said before, Jay, it's, it's about problem solving. It's about how can we start the journey with a customer, them coming in, telling us what they want to do, and then finding the outcome with as little uh, fuss and stress and worry for that client. They just know that everything's been taken care of through, you know, through our team. Um, we have this sort of bouncing ball mentality within the team um, so that... You know, the client will come in, so from that very first interaction, they're sort of bouncing their way through the whole team. They know where they're at at every single point in the journey and they're being looked after by having, you know, the right person in, in the right seat. We're a big believer in, you know, I'm, I'm a residential mortgage broker. I don't do every part of the process. We have a dedicated settlement team. We have, you know, the dedicated support team that will work with them during an application. We have the the commercial broking team. So it's about having you know, the right person in the right seat to make sure that the customer has the best possible experience. Was that the way it always was with Aussie White? Or <laughs> what was the evolution of that? Because again, having dealt with a lot of businesses, uh, a lot of small small businesses are trying to be everything to everyone. Mm. And that leap from 
being everything to everyone to actually having defined roles, it's actually not an easy jump. So what was the no. genesis of that for, for you guys at Aussie Wide? Yeah, no, not at all. When, when we started, when, when we took over uh, back in 2018, uh, there was three of us. So Scott, myself, and a, and a fellow called Ray. Ray's still with us today. Uh, runs the asset finance, equipment finance side of the team. Um, it, was, it was a slow burn because obviously, you know, you need to have the ability to invest back in the business and, and staff. Uh, so you need to be you know, generating the business that can allow you to then invest back in the business. So it was a slow burn. Uh, the dedicated settlement team uh, really only kicked off about a year and a half ago now. We were very lucky to pick up uh, a lady called Lisa, who I actually coincidentally worked with back in Melbourne uh, many, many years ago. I actually subcontracted to her for a little while uh, and learnt, you know, the settlement side of, of finance broking back then. Um, and she lived locally and we were able to, to bring her over. So that allowed us to set up the settlement team. Um, and the rest of it's just grown from, from slowly building the broking team as well. Um, we've never really hired a broker that had experience. Uh, we've just hired good people that we know can engage with clients um, and we can teach them the ins and outs of what we do. What's, your, what's the definition of a good person? Just someone that can, you know, uh, have a cus- build rapport with a customer is probably the biggest thing. Um, you know, uh, being a trustworthy advisor. Um, you know, when a client comes in, they want to know they're being given the best advice possible and pointed in the right direction. So, um, and, and they want to be able to trust in the person that they're dealing with. Is I that, think, a, is that sorry, a, I was going to say, is that a gut feel thing? I, the re, ben knows where I'm going with this, but uh, is that a gut feel thing or do you personality profile the people that come on board? How, how do you work out that they do actually have that trustworthiness and uh, dependability? Look, most of, most of our, pretty much all of our staff and the, and the team now actually have come from um, introductions from other either team members or, uh, you know, mutual people in the industry that we know. Um, we've never actually advertised for a job. Um, and in 2018, there was three of us. Um, now in, in the Geelong office here, uh, there's 14 uh, members of the team and, and then we've got a, an offshore team as well. Um, and every single person has been hired just through a, a mutual introduction. I was trying to remember, I think Scott explained to me, there's sort of like you've got a bit of a mini program internally where people come through and then they sort of roll through. Is that correct? Again, this was a little while ago who explained it to me, but said the same thing that no one had come, had moved across as a broker from anywhere else basically it was all sort of trained in-house and you had a bit of a, a system that was yeah. obviously working we sort of uh, joke it's the aussie wide academy in a way it's basically you'll just um you know a new person once we sort of know what role they want to go for whether it's a support role or, or a broker role um they'll just sit alongside uh, someone else or an experienced person in that role and, and just be trained up for a, for a period of months um with the with the brokers particularly they obviously need to go through the diploma uh, and training and, and getting the qualifications that they need so and they can't be doing loans in that time so while they're going through that process of, of studying uh, they're also doing hands-on experience with with a senior broker mm. so as a message to anyone out there looking for roles in in financial services broking that relationships are everything mm. like if, if you want to prove yourself get out and go to events like the one we did yesterday and talk to people because we're the same I think the majority of people in this business we do have a few that we've recruited and advertised for but the bulk of the people in this business have come from a personal endorsement from either a client one of the one of the uh, the planners and yeah that that personal endorsement means a lot absolutely it's um yeah it's it's the biggest insight into someone's personality and are they going to be able to build that rapport um you know i think uh, and and meeting people in their Say sort of natural environment, not in a you know across the boardroom table interview in scenario. Suit. Yeah, about, thre- uh, about three beers in is yeah. a, about the good time to get <laughs> a, good take him for a n- nine holes of golf and really see what they're yeah. like. Ask, ask Scott, but I'm pretty sure a few of the team have been hired either from the dog park or the pub. So, <laughs> yeah, um, <laughs> yeah it, it's def- definitely a good litmus test. Uh, just on the on that concept of culture, you touched on that. That uh, sort of uh, grooming's probably not. It's not careful. We've got to be yeah. careful with that. But actually, people evolving through your business, culture's a bit of a catch cry. But uh, you mentioned in some of the sort of pre-show notes about the sort of amazing team culture. It's something that is like the holy grail for most small businesses. What is it about the Aussie-wide team that you've done to sort of develop and foster that culture that you is so, so revered now? Look, Jay, I think it comes back to that, that point that we've hired just good people. 
you know, good people that can get along with each other. Um, we put a, we have our little internal social club. Uh, we try to do a, a function sort of every couple of months where the team will, will catch up, you know, either during or after work hours and do some form of activity. Um, and I think we've sort of really built that environment where we're all just there to support each other. Um, you know, we've got a, a few team members away at the moment, but they can go away happily because they know one of the other brokers is looking after their, their customers just as well as they would. So it really is just that, that team mentality. Um, you know, we're all there to support each other. And I, I think it all just comes back to the fact that we're all just, yeah, we've just found good people that, that can all get along and, and there's no, no big egos, no one's trying to outdo anyone. It's all just about we're there to support each other because if we know if we support each other, the winner is is the customer. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's, it's certainly important. It's a very important aspect of any small business and I think gets lost a lot when we talk uh, product and strategy. We have a tendency sometimes to get to, uh, to jump straight into product and strategy without understanding that you know, it's important to build relationships first. Mm. On that, let's talk some product strategies and what you're here <laughs> to talk about, which is uh, uh, people's finance lending. We wanted to ask you a few questions about sort of the state of the world. Uh, let's go a little bit, Michael. The state of Geelong, Australia, in, in the sort of lending environment. Um, let's, let's talk a little bit about sort of potentially the sort of increasing complexity of home loans or the perceived complexity of home loans. Uh, what, what are some of the common misconceptions that uh, people have when they come in to see you for finance, whether it be an investment property, their first home, a refi? Uh, are there things that people are presenting with you at the moment that are surprising? Uh, and if so, what are they? Look, I think probably one of the, the bigger ones, especially in the first home buyer market, is just the feeling that they're not in a position to do something um, and I think sometimes that stops people from reaching out and actually you know exploring can I can I get into the property market now so um, probably that's the, the first one actually just coming in and, and then we can run through you know what you are actually in a really good position there's this government grant we can take advantage of there's you know family guarantees we can talk about so I think it's just that that old thing you don't know what you don't know so um, people feeling they're not in the right position we can very quickly work out if they actually are. Uh, and, and that's one of the best feelings in this job is when you know, you've had someone come in that don't think they're in a position to get into their first home and then all of a sudden, um, you know, here we are a few months later and they've, they've made an offer and been successful on their first property. Um, probably the other one is how in-depth banks will go into everything. We hear this one a lot, oh, I don't think I can get a loan because we've eaten out a little bit too much lately and Uber Eats and... Uh, you know, too many holidays and things like that. Um, obviously, understanding a client's expenses is, is really important. We don't want to be, you know, um, we want to make sure that the bank is doing an accurate assessment. But a lot of that stuff's discretionary. And a lot of changes in the industry recently have been that lenders don't necessarily need to be, you know, going through those statements with that fine tooth comb like they may have a couple of years ago. Um, they're probably the, the two most common ones. We don't think we can do anything and are the lenders going to look too harshly on us? Do you with that point, sorry, on that initial point where people have, and again, it's probably through a lack of education we talk about a lot with schools and things, is people have no idea how good or bad their household economy is. Like mm. some people think, yeah, I'm ready to buy a house, I'm good to go. And they've got two grand in the bank. Uh, and then someone else might have a 20% deposit but just not have even asked the question. Yep. And they're actually in a perfect spot. Yeah, exactly. And they actually have no idea. And it's dangerous because you hear little bits you know, in the media. And that's where people probably perceive, oh, I'll never be able to buy a home. But they haven't got any structure, advice, or just a system to get themselves in that position. And we say that all the time. As We probably see it more about people think, oh, I'm going to have to work forever because they've got no concept of what their wealth can do for them to retire but very similar to entering the property market or upsizing or whatever that may be. Mm, exactly. Look, I think we sort of, not to focus just on first home buyers, but just as an example, like we, we sort of um, look at the debt as the, 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 lend, the loan, the debt at the end of it, that's just the thing that makes it possible. You know, buying a house and pulling all the government grants and, and stamp duty concessions and family assistance, that sort of stuff, that, that's what... You know, we're here to help guide on and, and actually build this transaction for you, how, how you can buy a home. Ultimately, the lender that we choose is just the vehicle that makes that happen. Um, and I think having that attitude towards debt is it's all about the home buying process. Same with investments. You know, you want to achieve this, 
you, you know, you've got your home, might have some equity in it. You want to get into investments, whether that's through personal names, super, trusts, whatever the structure might be. The lenders are just there to make that a possibility. Um, so I think having that shift that we're here to help achieve the goals is, is sort of what probably helps, um, you know, customers realise what is possible. It probably leads into another point around, again, I think you say 40 lenders maybe on the panel that you might look at. It seems it, to be a new one every day at the yeah. moment. And then filtering that down, again, your process, and that's your, you know, your expertise to, to probably identify very quickly, okay, there's probably 10 here that might suit this scenario. You know, I had one recently purchase, person purchasing a property and um, deal will help me out, but they were, you know, they were on income protection. So quickly you could, you know, wipe out nearly all of them but he could funnel that down work out the few that were suitable mm -hmm. and then look at those more focused um what's the general process there to work that out is it again professional judgment you've probably got systems and processes with that as well yeah look um often it's actually easier when you have very limited lenders to choose from with a client scenario whether it be serviceability whether it be um you know personal circumstances around self-employed or, or whatever it might be so sometimes it's actually easier more a lot easier when you've only got a couple to choose from um benefit of having a, a large panel um often sometimes the harder ones are where you can almost choose from 20 banks for a customer so you're sort of sitting there you know because we obviously can't be the one to say you have to go with this bank it, it's you know we, we give the customers choice and our role is just to facilitate that choice um, so sometimes when you've got the whole market to choose from, it's actually a little bit more challenging. Um, it really just comes down to asking the questions, you know, what are the requirements and objectives of, of the customer? Uh, is it uh, offset accounts? Is it redraw? Is it branch access? Um, you know, is it a particular type of investment like we are talking about before, Ben, with the NDIS stuff? Like, what is it within the client's requirements um, will help drive our decision? Um, and then. Then we get down to fees and, and rates and, and really picking apart the, the, the differences. We're very lucky in the industry. We've had some big advances in technology in the last sort of couple of years. Um, some new systems that have come in that allow us to very, very quickly put a client scenario in um, and then uh, it, it spits out the results basically of, of what every lender would, would give that client as a, as a borrowing capacity, some ideas on current rates and things like that. So it's really about starting with what the customer needs and then sort of funneling down to the result all about understanding who they are which again same for us if you understand who they are and what they're trying to achieve then you can you can save a lot of time because people will go the wrong way they'll just look at you know one bank and then they'll look at all the reasons why that won't work for them instead of just starting fresh understanding what they are who they are and what they're trying to achieve and then and then layering up from there uh, the the amount of times a, a customer will, will come in first interaction with us and the first thing they'll say is oh I went to my bank that I have my transaction banking with and they've said, no, I can't get a loan. Um, I'm not sure if you, got a, you can help. It's like, well, yeah, that bank would never have helped you. That's just their policy. However, here's 25 that will. Um, so it's just having that product knowledge. Again, it comes back to you know what you know and you don't know what you don't know. Um, I think one thing that has probably changed, but uh, speaking for some of the older clients, is that they have a... They have a loyalty to their bank that the bank does not reciprocate, whereas uh, younger people, um, they're a bit more open-minded to moving to benefit themselves but you still get the odd, odd client who's been with their bank for 20 years and think oh they've always been good to me and you know this that and the other sometimes you've just got to be brute like you've got to look after yourself like they are mm. at the end of the day will care to an extent oh ex look exactly the um i think the cba dolomites program um <laughs> was probably one of the best marketing strategies ever wow um it was a ripper wasn't it <coughs> The amount of pay, uh, you know, customers in that sort of generation that come in, I've banked for CBA my whole life because of Dolomites. Um, they got their first credit card mailed to them at 18. Yep. Just yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's brilliant. Still there. Um, but yeah, it, look, it's, it's um, as I said, the amount of times customers will come in, current banks said no, plenty of other lenders will help out. That, that's, that's what our role is, you know, mm. to pick that sort of apart. I think what, what's a shame, and hopefully things like the podcast uh, and you talking about this helps people that are nervous about like we get it with investment people say listen I, I'm not going to go and speak to someone because I don't have enough money or you know I'm not ready yet sometimes they need someone third party to them just to say no you're okay you're on the right track or mm. no there is an option there for you to do it same with lending like I'm assuming and I shouldn't assume but I I would say that your message would be something like come and talk to us and we'll, yeah. we'll, we'll help decide whether or not and we'll be honest with you and if it's mm. not right for you we'll actually say you're not ready yet and then give you a couple of steps to 
uh, to go away with and sort of uh, self-assess and come back to us when you are. 100%. It's all about this is what you can do now. Does it line up with what you want to achieve? Yes or no? If it's a no, cool, let's keep in touch. And as things change through that customer's you know, personal circumstances, we'll just keep reassessing. Um, we were talking just before about the, the stage three tax cuts that, that just came in. You know, We had customers one month ago that couldn't quite get the loan amount they need, whereas now they can. Um, nothing's changed in their circumstances. It's just simply that they've got slightly higher net income from the tax cuts, so now the lender will give them the loan they need. So I think it's always just about checking in, understanding where you are and where you want to get to. And, and you know, a, a good broker's role, just like a good planner, is laying out those steps um, to help, you know, to give the customer uh, optimism as well. Um, the amount of times we have people come in saying, oh, I went to see a broker previously. They told me I was no chance, couldn't buy a house. And, and here we are, you know, a few months later, you've helped us get a property because you've helped us put some steps in place. And whether that's, you know, a real common one at the moment um, that we're seeing a lot of is with the indexation changes to HEX. Um, can we maybe consider closing the HEX debt down uh, to give us better capacity? It helps the customer two ways. One, higher capacity. Two, gives them more net cash flow um, into their average pay cycle. Um, simple little things like that. If, you, if you're looking for the solution, you can generally find it. I think that's a massive thing I get annoyed about where they don't, where people don't give people the next step. Might, maybe not right now, can you do this? But if you do one, two, three things, you know, give them something to aim for. Otherwise, just get them a negative experience. They don't do anything to improve it. And in two years' time, they'll come back and they'll have the same conversation and then they'll start to do those three mm. things. So, you know, it's always, it's not right now. Often we have that with clients. We go, go, right, here's a couple of things over the next six months, 12 months, you know, we'll touch base and make sure you're doing them. Um, but that will be the trigger for you to be able to do that, you know, more significant goal. 100%. Yeah, you're setting a foundation for them, which if they don't come and speak to us, that foundation doesn't exist. Mm. One of the things that was in the original bio, you talked about sort of interest fees and tax. And I was, I was thinking about that in terms of how much value clients actually place upon uh, the, the, the numbers and the, the, uh, the, the value that you can add around just giving them uh, sort of a product at the end of the day. What a, I was thinking about tax. So what, talk to me a little bit about from, from a tax planning point of view. How does tax planning, most people when they're thinking about uh, restructuring their debt, it's probably not the first thing that comes to mind when they're mm. thinking tax unless they're very well versed in sort of investments. But on the tax side of stuff, what are you doing to actually improve people's uh, tax position with their lending and refinances? Yeah, look, uh, obviously we need to be very uh, careful. We're not tax advisors, we're not accountants. That's so, the right answer. So. That was a trick question. <laughs> I was going to say, I thought you tried to trip him yeah. up. <laughs> Compliance done. Um, so we generally uh, have very good relationships with, with customers, accountants mm. and, and planners um, so that we all work together to, to achieve that goal. Um, you know, with the tax side of things, it's probably just understanding, having the right structure um, from, from the start. You know, if a customer's long-term goals over the next five, 10, 15 years is to build an investment portfolio. Well, we want to make sure that we don't sort of, you know, possibly get the debts the wrong way around at the start. We don't want to, you know, have the owner OCK highly geared and have the first investment property lowly geared because, you know, then when we try to get the tax deduction benefits or the accountant does, I should say, um, it's hard to sort of unwind that because it all comes back to the purpose of your lending and, and that sort of thing. So I think it's just understanding the long-term goals and setting the right structures in place, but following the instructions of the accountant uh, and, and the planner um, to achieve that for, for the customer. And then, you know, from our point of view, we, we have a look at, <coughs> excuse me, um, with borrowing capacities and, and things like that, the negative gearing benefits are taken into consideration as well. Um, and then, you know, looking at, uh, you know, what sort of vehicles properties might be purchased in. So are we doing it in personal names? Are you now looking at super versus trusts and companies and and the, the pros and cons of that? Again, never giving the, the advice because we can't, but just working with the trusted advisors to, to set that up correctly. Yeah, more than ever, it's a team game, that I, isn't it? I was like going to say, I hope everyone that's listening to this listens to what you just said. And it wasn't a trick question, but I, I was interested in just that the collaborate the collaborative approach of you know what are the the uh, 
the intersecting circles. What do they call it? A Venn diagram of, mm. uh, you know, you got your accountant, your financial planner, your mortgage broker, your solicitor with overlapping elements in the middle. I think to me, that is where you get the best value, where clients get the best value because you do. You end up with the right product at the end of the day and the money to do what you want to do, but structures, mm. uh, tax considerations, but not only now. And that, back to your sort of motive, mode of operating and thinking about the future and problem solving it's so important a lot of the value is deferred value too it's like Mm. deferred reward that if you ignore you potentially set the client up for failure or a negative consequence at some point down the track and i think that to me back to what differentiates aussie wide from uh, other brokers and you're very gracious in not shit canning any other brokers which is just lovely uh but it does make a massive difference. Like it's a, it's a huge point of differentiation when you have uh, that collaborative approach and you do problem solve your way and care about what the outcome for the client's going to be, not only when they get the money, mm. but what happens in 12 months, five years, 10 years. And that also doesn't come overnight. No. Like that comes with experience. It's because you came from a financial planning background that you come from uh, from our world that uh, you've got that uh, that head on your shoulders. It's it's brilliant. You and see think- a lot of time where people have rushed that process and then when they then they get caught up big time later on. I think about where they've crossed the loans oh, over, which is crosses. probably like, and you almost every time you see that it's been either done directly with a bank. Um, or maybe a broker who's just rushed and just wanted to get the purchase done. And sometimes I think we have to have hard conversations with clients to say, look, this is gonna take longer. We need to wait for something else to get this in the correct order because otherwise you're gonna have a mess later on and you're gonna mm. sell a property and end up having no proceeds in your pocket that you were banking on. Um, again, you would have seen that. I see it every now and then, so I'm sure you see it all the time. Hit the nail on the head there, Ben. That's probably the biggest one is when a, a customer uh, traditionally uh, has maybe gone uh, to a branch directly um and just you know things were set up in probably not not as much of a a, a future view uh cross securing is probably the biggest one um where you know the owner arc and one or two investments have all just been tied together the strategy of the or the the, suppose the the goal of the customer might be to sell the owner arc and upgrade or sell one of the investments and then trying to pull all that apart as you said you know they're banking on certain proceeds to come through and the lender turns around and says, oh, no, you need to pay that debt down instead. And all of a sudden, um, the whole thing is a mess. And the amount of times you say to the customers, oh, you've got three loans here, three properties, are they crossed? And they're like, oh, I have no idea. Um, so there was no sort of consideration to the future in the way it was all set up. And, and as you say, you get it right to start with. Um, it just makes multiplying that so much easier. And I think with that, I've said to a few people, it's okay that you've done that as long as we know. Mm. But like, But often people... They just didn't even know yep. um, because they weren't. It, it wasn't explained to them. They, they went to the bank and said, "We need 450." And they said, "Yeah, no worries. We'll just do this, this." They, they stopped listening once they said yes. Yeah. Um, so then they have no idea what they've actually got. All they know is that they got the money, they got what they wanted, and then they move on. Yeah. Um, and then they find out the hard way. Exactly. 10, f- five, ten, fifteen years later. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, can I take us off on a little tangent? Uh, you mentioned a couple of things about uh, technology and sort of how it sort of plays into your organization and makes things easier you mentioned some technology that you're using at the moment but how what roles tech played in your operations and the efficiencies that you've spoken about uh already yeah look uh we always when we took over aussie wide and, and set that up we we had the goal to be a paperless office and i think as, as a lot of businesses do these days modern businesses so that was a relatively straightforward one um but then the banks were still very manual um even up until a couple of years ago COVID was as bad as it was for a lot of reasons it was actually the catalyst to a lot of change in our industry so um pre-COVID loan application forms loan offer documents mortgages everything was all paper-based so we were trying to be a paperless office but you still had to print everything collect it sign it scan it uh fast forward to obviously a, a time in life when we couldn't see customers as easily um it advanced uh you know your online interview technology so zoom teams those sorts of things um uh, they're now recognized as a as a proper way of verifying identity of your customers you can you can do that digitally now 
Uh, lenders all moved to online uh, or e-sign application forms, um, which was a, a big start. Uh, and now it's all moved to e-sign loan offer documents as well. Um, so, you know, the uh, Victorian titles, mortgages can now be done electronically. They used to have a witness requirement, which meant they couldn't. Um, so that's been a big, a big change. Um, the other thing that it's probably done is put so much speed um, back in the market. So a uh, perfect example, we had a, a file yesterday that had to be reworked in the morning for settlement yesterday. Uh, new loan offer, it was approved, loan offer documents out, back, signed, returned, it settled at four o'clock yesterday, Arvo. And that's from getting reapproved at 11 a.m. Um, that did not exist five years ago. It was people were rushing into the city to swap checks over in you know Collins Street at the titles office. So um, it, yeah, tech, the advancements have mainly come from the lenders, uh, and then we found sort of our third-party tech providers like that that system I mentioned have sort of come in on the back of that. What about data collection for clients? So when you're you're collecting uh, reams of of data, uh, <laughs> the stuff that maybe. Uh, historically the clients had to bring to you how, how do you go about collecting all of that now yeah so i suppose the important thing there is to understand that every customer can be a little bit different we still absolutely have the customers that want to bring things in and could go to the bank print off the statements bring them in that's fine of course we can we can work with that um, but mostly it's through a, a portal system so an email link goes out it's all two-factor authenticated and all nice and safe um, and you can just upload everything. Uh, anything bank statement related, so transaction accounts, savings accounts, uh, existing home loan statements, that's all collected through a third party provider, um, bankstatements.com or Illion's the other name. Um, and again, that provides great insight for us because it doesn't just give us the statements we need with a click of a button, but it also categorizes all those expense categories that we were talking about as well. So we can get a really good view of a customer's situation to ensure that you know, the lending products that we're select, uh, recommending and putting them into are not unsuitable. Um, so, yeah, pretty much for most customers, everything is digital now. So... What, what, how much has it actually improved the turnaround time? So if you had, from when you began to today, what sort of turnaround time difference is there from uh, five years ago? Oh, look, in massive change. Um, from the old days where you had to get a, a, a fact find sort of you know, they'd print it out, fill it in, scan it back. We'd have to then manually enter that data ourselves um, and then start looking for options. Because everything is now online, our, our fact find forms are done through that portal, which links straight into our CRM software, which links straight into the, the bank's software. Um, so we could theoretically meet a customer in the morning and be applying for their loan at lunchtime um, if they could get us all the info. Uh, and if we were to go to a lender that had fast turnaround times, you could possibly be approved that afternoon. Um, and that's just because the lenders have had massive leap forwards, uh, as have you know businesses like ourselves in, in this speed and ability that we can not just collect the data that we need, and there is a lot of data. That's probably one of the biggest things we get is, oh, do I have to provide all of this? But it, we're not asking for it for fun. Uh, the bank needs to know that. But if we can enter all of that info um, quickly and accurately, then it, really, it, it just leads to such a better outcome. Um, for the customer. So what, what's the next tech, se tech evolution in finance? Look, this talk, you know, the AI word comes in um, where, you know, talking about AI finding the right lender for a customer. I'm not sure how that would go. I mean, I'm certainly not a, a tech whiz, but there is still so much personal um, advice and guidance in, in the industry. So I think tech is, I kind of feel tech's at its best point now you know we've got all these e-solutions that are nice and quick and efficient and fast and then you can link those systems and solutions with good advice i suppose so you're saying you're a luddite is that what you're saying <laughs> uh yes yes uh it's funny I, i'm thinking about ai as a as a tool you know like 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 most things it can be used poorly it can be used well mm. but in in our world I think, which is very similar to your world, it if it does anything, it actually frees us up to spend more time with clients. Mm. It actually spends it frees us up to actually spend more time time doing the the personal relationship, the problem solving one on one with people. I think if used 100%. well, uh, it should allow the people that are good with relationships and good with connecting with people and good with problem solving to do it even better. So, uh, again, I've I've been sort of cautiously optimistic with tech. Obviously, it. There's a obviously massive security 
potential for mm-hmm. it to go wrong if it does go wrong. But I think if we're uh, if we're cautiously optimistic, then uh, yeah, the, the future should be bright. Is that right, Ben? Just waiting for you to do a little AI plug. (laughs) No, no AI plug here today. Now, I'm mindful of time. I might uh, look at the the rapid fire questions. They don't have to be rapid fire responses, but uh, a couple of couple of things I wanted to touch on. One of them was like for people looking to invest in property for the first time. um, What what sort of strategies or tips would you give to people looking to invest in property for the first time? You know, maybe sort of top five tips for people looking to get into property for the very first time uh well number one probably understanding where they where they sit so to make any transaction uh successful whether it's buying investment buying owner rock um we need to have the combination of equity or deposit um and capacity um and then the other one i throw in there is policy the sort of little three pillars of, of lending um policy one's up to us we sort of make sure we navigate that one but you know, if a, if a customer is looking to invest for the first time, the power of equity cannot be um, under, under sort of considered. Um, so coming in, understanding the value in their current property, uh, and then we can clearly show strategies of how easily we can pull out that equity. And when we talk about that, we're sort of generally, because Ben, we're trying to avoid cross-securing <laughs> most times, um, pulling out, you know, a 20% plus costs deposit from the existing property. Uh, and then having a approval for standalone purchase at sort of an 80% lend to avoid fee, extra fees and mortgage insurance um, on, on the purchase. Um, as I said earlier, you know, the serviceability for an investment property is actually improved because we can use the proposed rental income. Um, we can use the negative gearing benefits from that tax deductible debt. So generally, for people wanting to invest, as long as they're on good incomes and they're, they're, they're you know, they're quite comfortably servicing the debt that they have now as long as they've got equity they they could be ready to go now um, and that's probably back to that earlier point of people just not necessarily knowing or having the confidence to explore where they're at so tip one would probably be just come and find out where you're at you know do we have enough equity to start that process I think the cash flow <coughs> side is the part that people sometimes they understand the equity or they have good cash flow or they think they do but having both of those things together is probably the part that people not as often have mm. going for them. And then, yeah, they have equity, but they're just servicing the debt they've got. Well, if they're going to go and add in an investment loan, you know, $600,000 more debt, it's going to be negatively geared from a tax and cash flow position at the moment. Yep. Um, how will that impact their day to day? You know, mm. will they actually still be able to afford to live the life that they want to? Or they feel, will they feel great? Or we've got an investment property, but no more you know, going out for dinner yeah exactly look i think there's the difference there between what the lender would let you have um in terms of capacity and you know they'll throw that 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 loan amount at you but also tying that in with what the customer is happy to to take on exactly to your point ben you, you never want to just because the bank says you can have a million dollar loan that's fine but you might only feel comfortable with a 500 grand loan because you know because we obviously work out what the repayments will be and we can help with budgeting uh, and putting that into their cash flow and making sure that it's not going to get them into into strife. I suppose you look at that now the people who borrowed max over the last you know, decade um, and now the now the rates you know, probably tripled for them mm. now they're stuck. Yeah absolutely well, going back you know APRA the regulator had have the assessment rate um, buffer sort of uh, cap on on lending i suppose where the actual interest rate generally has a three percent buffer put on top of it and the lenders assess their ability to repay at that higher rate so for a standard owner occupy at the moment that might be assessed at you know 9.1 9.2 percent if we go back three years ago um actual rates for investment was i don't know three three and a half percent something like that those actual rates now are sort of six and a half um but the assessment rate back then was six and a half so it is kind of the first time in our in our history with this regulation from APRA where the assessment rate is being tested. Uh, unfortunately, we are seeing you know you do see people that are you know did go to the max and now feeling it a bit and you're having to offload those investments. But um, I think that's the important thing as well for now is that lending should be considered quite safe. You know, assessment rates at nine and a half percent. If interest rates get to nine and a half percent, you guys are probably better <laughs> at understanding that well, the impacts of that than me. But um, I, I just can't see obviously that happening. So anyone borrowing now should hopefully be a bit more confident that it's not going to be stretching them too far. You talk about the interest rate trends and how people are dealing with that at the moment. What 
Are you seeing any other common themes or trends in the market with loans at the moment that people should be aware of? Fixed rates are probably the, the one that comes to mind. So obviously there's a lot of talk about what's going to happen with variable rates and I wish we had that, that crystal ball and when we knew and you know we, the rate cuts seem to keep getting pushed out in, in terms of when they're expected to come through. But fixed rates for me are probably the, the good indicator at the moment. So you know, if you, again, if you look at an average owner OCK variable rate is around your sort of, you know, six one, six two. Um, we have fixed rates now coming in in the high fives for say two years fixed rate. So lenders aren't, in my opinion, in the uh, game of losing money. So if they're offering fixed rates lower than the current variable, to me that does give a bit of optimism that the variables will be de down if at the same level or possibly, hopefully, a bit lower than that within that period. Um, that's probably the biggest trend that we're, we're seeing. Um, investment rates have come down quite a bit. There's some lenders with some very attractive investment rates out there at the moment. Um, you know, some of these investment rates are lower than the owner-occupied rates um, from, you know, more of the major banks. So we haven't seen much movement in the variables. L lender specials come out all the time. You know, um, they call them under the table offers, you know, certain loan amounts above a, you know, certain rate with a, depending on the loan to value ratio they might give you an extra 10 or 15 basis points off the rate um, they're not publicly advertised so there's not a lot of movement in the variable market but it's probably the fixed market that I, I look at the most at the moment are you finding people seeing those fixed rates lower are starting a, a eager to jump in and fix their rates like is that something that people are trying to do and need to be cautious about that yeah the conversations definitely started happening again we probably haven't had the fixed rate conversation really for the last two years because the fixed rates have been so much higher than the variables um, but now that they're starting to come down a bit absolutely we're we're seeing customers ask that question should i consider fixing and it's not necessarily to try and beat the bank it's more just about cash flow and budgeting i was going to say what's your again personal thoughts on on fixed rates <laughs> It's every circ it depends on the circumstances really. Like, you know, if, if you want that absolute certainty and you don't want to be sitting there stressing about what the Reserve Bank and then the lenders are going to do each month, um, then fixing is a great option because it just means that for the next one, two, three years, however long you fix for, you can just sit back and, and not worry about it. If, if that repayment amount is comfortable for you, then just focus on getting that paid. So um, I think, yeah, it, it comes down to the scenario of the customer really. The, the important yeah. part of that is noting that it does depend yeah. and I think the important part of having a relationship with someone that you can actually talk through the scenarios with is that you help them rationalise which is actually going to be best for them. They'll make the decision but if you give them the information to be able to make an informed decision themselves they walk away going, okay, uh, this suits me. Yeah. In my circumstances this is what actually suits me and I think that is much better than trying to compare or beat the bank or look at what your, your next door neighbour's rate was What's, what's suitable for your own economy, your household? Yeah. That's the most important thing. The other side of that, and this is probably reflecting on what we've seen over the last decade, is you d it doesn't have to be all or nothing on that too. Like mm. yeah, so many clients we had, again, fixing 50, fi go fixed 50, variable 50, so sit on the fence, have some certainty, have some ability to still see your rates come down, all those sorts of options that are out there. A lot of people just think, oh, it's all or nothing, got to fix yep. the whole thing or I don't fix any of it. Yeah, nice. so many hybrids. Absolutely, splitting loans is, is the, uh, split loans is the term there. Um, and exactly as you said, Ben, you, there's no, um, you know, there's no guideline on that. You could have 50-50, you could have 90-10, whatever ratio you want of variable, fixed, um, if it's investment, it can be paying principal and interest repayments, interest only. Like these are all the sorts of things that you can, you know, build within that scenario for for a customer. I think for the uninitiated, that's really important for them to hear as well. That you know, we think I, I want to go and get a loan, so I just get a loan. The structure of the loan, again, the importance of actually going and speaking with someone, cannot be uh, oversold. Mm. It, we should be talking about it all the time. If you've got an issue, or if you're thinking about lending you need to go and speak to someone who knows their shit mm. and can talk to you about structure and time frame and cash flow and your economy uh, your household economy because that's what's actually going to get you the best result you just go and try and wing it yourself you'll inevitably come up with some pain points definitely uh, i've got one last question unless ben's got some more and this one's a bit of a, a bit of a, a, a vested interest on the financial side of things just inquisitive about how you think about this but what What's the best piece of financial advice 
you've ever been given and did you implement it (laughs) (laughs) um oh look it's probably for me it's um uh that debt is not bad um it's it's don't be afraid of debt and and use it to your advantage so you know if, if you if you're scared of taking on debt then it's very hard to build wealth um, if you're happy to take on debt and, and in the right way, um, you know, not being rushed about it and, and not extending yourself too far, um, then it can really work for you. Um, you know, you, you can um, have an investment property that f- close to pays for itself, um, depending on the rental yields, um, and then you sit back and pick up the capital growth. Um, using debt to get into the, the equity markets, um, you know, um, investing in funds and, and um superannuation investments things like that um that yeah debt can be a really good tool uh to help advance where you want to get to if used wisely that's Mm. probably i think it's a massive thing because there's a people have a very warped perception of debt as just evil Mm. Um, i think it's a generational thing there's a generational aversion to and you think about our parents or or my parents the the focus and Peter was a little bit different, but mum, conservative, it was, listen, we get debt only because we desperately, we have to, and it's gone, like we're just getting rid of it. And as soon as I can get that title back, I'm relieved and the pressure's off rather than, I suppose, and it's a little bit like investing too, that, that the concept of risk that people sit aside the decision to invest or the decision mm. to lend. If you can get some support, you can get some advice, you can get some counsel around those things and back to dolomites and kids and education (laughs) there's a generation of kids now that we should be educating better around the the ability to invest the benefit of investing periodically over a long period of time and also not to be afraid of debt Mm. not to be afraid of debt that you can actually use it to leverage uh your wealth and you to be honest you're probably going to need to like as we as we move through the next few decades you're probably going to need to do that you know need to take some educated and counseled risk to be able to uh to grow grow your wealth the two sides of that is debt on the way up as you increase it but what the other gap is that the people that don't have a clear plan on how to get rid of it Mm. like i think you need debt it's essential to build the wealth um but you've also got to understand that point in time where debt needs to start to be relieved. So whether that's through sale of a property, um, especially we say around that sort of pivot point as people start to approach retirement is often they need to look at ways to get rid of a debt. And that can be a chunky transaction like a sale of a property or, Mm. or realization of another asset. So the process of knowing what you've got and building debt progressively, but then also knowing you can on your own terms, pay that back down again. Because I don't think, again, I'm sure it has happened, but there's not very often people in retirement are served well by having too much debt. It's no. very, very rare that that's a preferred outcome. Oh, 100%. I think, you know, we have some very basic calculators. You could easily search an extra repayment calculator anywhere. Our website has some great resources. But, you know, showing a, a customer, um, you know, your minimum payment is is this. But if you can afford to put an extra 50 100 dollars a week a month fortnight whatever whatever it is uh over the term of that loan how how quickly you can pay that debt off um and also how much interest you can save uh, on that debt simply by just making these little extra tweaks here and there i think that is the role of a good mortgage broker it's not just get someone a loan and say goodbye it's let's just yeah again the loan is the vehicle to make this possible now let's come up with strategies to to get that paid off as quick as possible if it is the owner occupied um you know use that investment debt to to you know give us those tax savings and whatever it might be to help pay off that owner occupied even faster um and just back to the point earlier about you know debt is not something to be afraid of certain debts are um so short-term debts you know your, your after pays is it pays basically debts that uh sort of suggest possibly living a little bit beyond means they're debts that we obviously want to try and avoid and, and clear up where possible. Um, you know, taking on huge car loans um, instead of you know looking at property and stuff like that. That that's sort of where maybe we've got to have that right attitude towards debt. Um, but yeah, as a whole, it's just I suppose understanding what debt is and using it to your advantage. Beautiful. I think that's probably a nice Good place wrap. to to wrap it up, uh, Andrew. 
before we do wrap up, you mentioned uh, some of the calculators on the website. Let's talk about where people can find those calculators and where they can get a hold of uh, Scott, yourself and the team um, at Aussie Wide. Yeah, beautiful. Uh, so the office is in Moorable Street, 255 Moorable, just uh, up near Myers Street there. Anyone's always welcome to, to pop in. Um, website, uh, aussiewidefs.com.au, uh, has some amazing resources on there. We've spent a lot of time building out the resources tab there. So, and it's all completely free and no obligation and, and easy to use. Uh, and then just the usual socials, uh, Insta and, uh, and Facebook. At AussieWide on all of those, is that right? Uh, at AussieWide, yes. Um, slowly building that up. It hasn't been our, our focus for a few years, but starting to, to get there. The website's been the, the main. You made it to focus. our Instagram on the golf day, so that's all that matters. <laughs> I was going to say, you're probably Absolutely. if you're looking for Scott, probably in the first hole at Barwon Heads, it would probably be where you'd find him. Oh, yeah, the time, exactly. so. It is Friday, so yeah. <laughs> uh, Andrew, thanks again. Appreciate the time. We look forward to a round two, and uh, thanks for everything that you do uh, for us and our clients and also uh, the clients that you have uh, with Aussie Wide. Thanks again. No, thank you so much for having me. Absolute pleasure. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. If you're keen to understand more about how financial advice could benefit you, follow us on Instagram, Facebook and Twitter at Burke Britain FP or Google Burke Britain Financial Partners. Check out our client reviews, testimonials and make a time to meet one of our certified financial planners by clicking book now on our website. Thanks for listening. Any information contained in this podcast is of a general nature only. No account was taken as to the objectives, financial situation, or needs of any particular person. Therefore, before making any decision, listeners should consider the appropriateness of any information with regard to their particular objective, financial situation, needs, and seek independent advice from a licensed professional specific to their circumstances. All right, hit it. That translates to don't be a moron and act on what some random person says on a podcast. Take personal responsibility, do your homework, ask questions, and speak to an actual human that knows what they're talking about before you do anything. PP Financial Solutions Proprietary Limited Trading is Burke Britain Financial Partners are authorised representatives of AMP Financial Planning Limited AFS license number 232706.